Hi, my name is Alexis Rimbaud, Head of Research and Product Development at Random Walk Imaging. I'm going to talk to you about QSpace Trajectory Imaging, or QTI, which is one of the methods that we have implemented in our software for data analysis, DViewer. To give you a better sense of where QTI comes from, I will review a few conventional diffusion methods first. Let's start with Trace Diffusion Weighted Imaging, or Trace DWI. For this technique, you can acquire three diffusion images, each of them associated with one specific gradient direction. Here you have this SX signal that is linked to this uh, gradient along the X direction, or the left-right direction, SY as a gradient along the anterior, posterior, or Y direction, and a Z a gradient along the inferior, superior, or Z direction. In this case, you can see that the corpus callosum, the optical tracts, and the corticospinal tracts are dark. In addition to these, you can acquire a non-diffusion weighted image, S0. Once you've done so, you can compute this SDWI signal, which is the cubic root of the product of SX, SY, SZ, and related to this S0 signal that you acquired. And you can see that this SDWI is S0 with a decaying exponential factor given by the B value, which is the overall strength of the diffusion encoding, and this ADC, which is the apparent diffusion coefficient of a given voxel. This apparent diffusion coefficient is inversely related to the voxel averaged cell density. A more advanced method, diffusion causes imaging, or DKI, builds upon trace DWI to measure tissue heterogeneity, or tissue complexity. In this case, you see that the signal in DKI is actually the same signal as trace DWI, this S0 exponential minus B times the ADC. But you have this second term in the exponential that is linked to B squared. And this term features K, which is the mean ketosis, which is this measure of tissue heterogeneity. I can rewrite this equation as the logarithm of the ratio between SDK and S0. And here it becomes apparent that this DKI is actually a two term cumulant expansion. The first cumulant is this minus ADC and the second cumulant is ADC squared times K squared divided by 6. The problem with DKI is that the mean ketosis is not specific. You could have two different sources of heterogeneity that would contribute identically to the mean ketosis. For instance, you have this voxel content that is made of uh, isotropic diffusion tensors with varying sizes. This corresponds to varying cell densities. And in this second voxel content, you have anisotropic diffusion tensors that corresponds to elongated cells, and in this case, these are randomly uh, oriented. In a way, Q-space trajectory imaging, or QTI, is a generalization of DKI. It resembles it, but it preserves the tensorial nature of the diffusion process. So here, for example, you, you find that the signal in QTI writes as S0 times exponential minus the B matrix, or B tensor, with the Frobenius inner product with the average diffusion tensor for the voxel. And here you have this one half B outer product squared times inner product with the covariance tensor of the voxel content. So this is a generalization, it's still a two term cumulant approach. It's just that these cumulants are expressed via tensors this time and not numbers as the ADC or the mean ketosis that we found before. In this case, you can define specific measures of heterogeneity from the covariance tensor. And this covariance tensor to be estimated reliably requires multidimensional diffusion MRI. The specific measures of heterogeneity include the isotropic mean ketosis, which is linked to the variance of cell density, and the anisotropic mean ketosis, which is linked to the microscopic anisotropy. Microscopic anisotropy is defined as the anisotropy of the underlying cells without the confounding effect of their alignment over the voxel scale, unlike fractional anisotropy. The QTI fit spans 28 dimensions. You have one dimension for the S0, six independent elements of the average diffusion tensor of the voxel content, and 21 independent elements in the covariance tensor. However, this fit can be recast as a linear problem, which makes it incredibly fast. A QTI inversion takes roughly a few seconds. The problem is that QTI only accounts for the first two cumulants of the signal, and therefore allows for unphysical results. For example, the isotropic mean ketosis that is related to the variance of cell densities 
may be negative in certain voxels featuring predominant noise. Of course, parameter maps can be created afterwards because we already know that these kind of quantities should be positive numbers. And then this is also a way to detect voxels that have very high noise and to simply correct them. This is typical QTI parameter maps estimating using our data analysis software DViewer in a dataset obtained by United Imaging in China. This dataset features a grade 1 meningioma in the left temporal lobe. Here you see the S0 map, or the non-diffusion weighted signal. This is the mean diffusivity map. This is the fractional anisotropy map. And this is the isotropic mean ketosis and anisotropic mean ketosis maps. Finally, this is the directionally encoded color MKA, whose color is given by the orientation of the average intravoxel diffusion processes, and the intensity is given by the MKA. Note that in gray matter, this map shows up white, because you have microscopic anisotropy, but the elongated cells are randomly oriented over the voxel scale. Thank you very much for your attention.